Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today to celebrate uh, one of the most important and political, uh, political and constitutional moments and reforms in the history of our nation. 100 years ago, in 1920, Tennessee became the crucial 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Uh, long overdue, women had secured their constitutional right to vote. This milestone built on decades of hard work by countless brave and remarkable women and their allies determined to see the realization of this basic right so essential to our democracy. Now, not long after, in 1923, Alice Paul herself, a leader of the women's suffrage movement, wrote the first version of an Equal Rights Amendment, which was introduced into Congress that year. It took Congress nearly five decades till 1972 to propose the Equal Rights Amendment uh, to the states. Um, efforts to ratify that amendment continue to this day. Um, on January 15th of this year, uh, Virginia became the latest state uh, to vote to ratify the amendment, the 38th state to vote to ratify the amendment. Uh, Virginia's decision has brought renewed focus to the important aspiration of making gender equality an explicit constitutional guarantee. It has also brought to the forefront interesting and highly consequential legal questions about the amendment process. So today, we gather to explore these recent developments and to celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment. And I'm looking forward to hearing from this distinguished panel. And I know that you are too, so I'm going to stop talking momentarily. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment to introduce and welcome our panelists. So um, uh, Michael Klarman is the Kirkland and Ellis Professor of Law. Uh, Professor Klarman's teaching and scholarship primarily focus on constitutional law and history. Uh, the moderator next to him is uh, Jill Lepore, the David Woods Kemper, 41, Professor of American History at Harvard University. Professor Lepore is a distinguished historian and the author of countless books and articles on a wide range of topics. And then at the end, is uh, Julie Sook, who is Dean for Master's Programs and Professor of Sociology, Political Science, and Liberal Studies at uh, CUNY. Uh, she is the author of a terrific and timely new book entitled We the Women, The Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. And shortly, we will be joined by Professor Vicki Jackson, uh, who is not here, whose plane has been delayed, but she'll be here, we are told, uh, in time to participate in the panel. Uh, Professor Jackson is the Thurgood Marshall Professor of Constitutional Law. Professor Jackson writes and teaches about US constitutional law and comparative and constitutional law. Uh, before I turn the program over to Professor Lepore, let me give a special thanks to Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson and Professor Martha Minow. Uh, who organized this terrific uh, uh, conference and uh, brought together this wonderful group. And so without further delay, let me give you Professor uh, Lapore, who will take it from here. Great. Thanks very much, Dean Manning. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out on uh, you know one of the last public gatherings of the current <laughs> coronavirus season. Uh, it's great to see you all out here. Um, and I do we do expect that Professor Jackson will be able to join us in about a half an hour or so. But we have a contingency plan as we are all now going from one contingency plan to the next. Um, but the way, this, the way this session is going to work is that Professor Klarman will begin by speaking about, uh, and he has an extraordinary task before him, trying to wrestle into uh, a brief set of remarks, the extraordinarily complicated and illuminating history of suffrage and of the 19th Amendment. And then Professor Sook will speak about the 100-year history of the ERA from its drafting uh, in the early 1920s. And Professor Jackson, when she joins us, will uh, outline the current state of the ratification, uh, the, the resurrection of the ERA ratification. Uh, we do hope to have plenty of time for some questions from the audience, and also we'll have a discussion among the panelists. The one thing I just wanted to mention is that in the interest of uh, public health and hygiene, we're not going to be passing around a microphone. Um, so when we get to the q and I'm going to ask you all to speak very loudly, and I will repeat questions for the purposes of the recording. Um, so Professor Klarman. Great. Uh, I'm going to stand up. Um, if John has it, did the dean take off? I wanted to file an objection about the removal of the candy bowl this morning. I understand that coronavirus is really serious, but some of us can't get through the day without our visits to the dean's office to pick up some candy. All right. So 
Um, I was asked to talk for 15 minutes. I'm actually setting my alarm so Joe won't have to cut me off. Uh, I have a lot to t tell you about. There is a long history here. I'm going to do it pretty quickly. Uh, and I'm going to start at the beginning of the story. Uh, Seneca Falls in 1848 was a gathering, uh, an historic meeting in upstate New York of male and female feminists who were articulating a women's rights agenda. Uh, the meeting flowed out of the public ab uh, abolitionist anti-slavery movement of the 1830s. Women had played a role in that movement, but the idea in the 1830s of women participating in a public gathering, much less speaking at it, was seen as a pretty, pretty radical step. Many of the women who had participated as abolitionists naturally turned their reformist impulses afterwards to ways in which women themselves were constrained by traditional gender laws and gender mores, which they analogized to slavery. This is not dissimilar to the ways in which the second wave feminism of the 1960s emerged from the participation of women in the civil rights movement for racial justice. Among the reforms that were being demanded at Seneca Falls were married women's property laws, which would protect married women from uh, drunk and dissolute husbands squandering the property they, they brought into marriage, and also uh, loosening of divorce restrictions. Women were often barred from getting a divorce even if their husband had abandoned them, and married women uh, did not have civil rights, so if they couldn't get divorced, they couldn't recover those rights. The right to vote was actually seen as the most radical demand on the agenda at Seneca Falls. Not all of the delegates agreed that it should be part of their agenda. Uh, leading female abolitionist Lu uh, Lucretia Mott actually told Elizabeth Cady Stanton while they were organizing the convention that if they asked for the ballot for women, it would make them look ridiculous. And Stanton's abolitionist husband refused to participate in the meeting because he felt that the demand for suffrage would turn the proceedings into a farce. Uh, women's suffrage was in tension with the separate spheres ideology, which tended to uh, govern gender roles at the time. That ideology relegated women to the private sphere, where they would tend to the hearth and home, take care of their husband's needs, raise their children, but certainly not participate in public events through politics. Married women's property rights and divorce reform were less head-on confrontations with that uh, traditional gendered separate spheres ideology than women's suffrage would be. In addition, slavery was obviously the dominant social reform issue of the 1830s, and it was difficult to focus attention at that time on women's suffrage. In addition, they had these other goals that seemed more easily obtainable, like married women's property laws and divorce reform. The Civil War and Reconstruction then focused national attention mainly on the rights of African Americans and, among other things, on their right to vote rather than the right of women to vote. Some women's suffrage leaders had anticipated otherwise. They had hoped that once abolition of slavery had been achieved, as it was with the 13th Amendment, that the demand for suffrage, which they had long subordinated, would now be something that they might be able to realize as well. Uh, in addition, women had played roles during the Civil War that they rarely had opportunities to participate in before the war. Uh, for example, nurses behind the battlefield or taking over and running the farms with their husbands and fathers and sons now off at war. Those experience had, experiences had led many to rethink the exclusion of women from the political sphere, which was something that would happen again more decisively during World War I. When the 15th Amendment was, in, was proposed enfranchising African Americans but not women, some suffragists were so angered that they decided they would have no choice but to oppose the amendment. Most abolitionists, including the great black abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass, uh, who actually lived in the 19th century, is not still alive today. Some people are not clear about that. Um, they felt that adding women's suffrage to the amendment would lead to its defeat and that women must accordingly continue to be patient and subordinate their demand for the suffrage to the realization of black suffrage. One wing of the women's suffrage movement then came out in opposition to the 15th Amendment, which simply protected black suffrage. The other wing of the movement supported the amendment, and the, amend the movement literally broke in half. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were in the wing opposing the 15th Amendment. 
they actually went so far as to actively campaign against its ratification, which led to some very strange political alliances. They literally worked with racist Democrats against black suffrage in Kansas in 1867, where both black suffrage and women's suffrage were on the ballot and both were handily defeated. Occasionally, they even made openly racist arguments in favor of women's suffrage, for example, that former slaves were, quote, ignorant, degraded, and depraved, and should not be placed above women as their rulers, judges, and jurors. So how did the 19th Amendment come about after women's suffrage failed in 1870? As a practical matter, getting Congress to support women's suffrage would require first women, winning women's suffrage in a bunch of states because congressional representatives, it quickly became apparent, would not support women's suffrage until the states that had elected them had done so on their own. States were perfectly free to enfranchise women on their own. The federal constitution leaves suffrage requirements, even in federal elections, up to the states. Once a state had enacted women's suffrage, its congressional representatives would then be a lot more likely to support a women's suffrage amendment, which could then impose that rule on states that were a little bit more recalcitrant about adopting it on their own. A women's suffrage amendment was first proposed in Congress in 1878, but at that time, not a single state authorized women's suffrage, and so not surprisingly, there was almost no support at that time for the amendment in Congress. In general, convincing a political community to expand the suffrage is difficult, probably for two reasons. First, legislators have an incentive not to expand the scope of the political community that elected them to office. If an all-male electorate put you in office, why take a chance on enfranchising women who may or may not vote the same way as men? The second obstacle to expanding the political community has to do with the political community itself rather than its representatives, and this is even for more formidable. Why would existing voters choose to share their power with others, particularly if those newcomers might systematically differ with them on particular political issues? That's why whites, especially in the South, were so resistant to enfranchising African Americans after the Civil War, and that's why most men reject women's suffrage. The existing gender norms and laws created quite a bit of male privilege with regard to property rights in marriage, with regard to rape rules within marriage, with regard to child custody allocations, with regard to divorce. Why risk enfranchising women and put that privileged position at risk? Plus, in addition, of course, the gender ideology that had arisen to justify the existing gender relationships would not have been very supportive of the idea of women participating in politics. Expansions of the suffrage generally take place for one of two reasons. One of those is material and the other is ideological. The material incentive applies when an existing block of voters can make a calculation, a reasonable guess, that expanding the suffrage will create new political allies for them. An example of that would be Republicans after the Civil War deciding to enfranchise African Americans, almost all of whom then proceeded to vote Republican. Now, of course, the opposing block of voters can figure that out just as well. They can make the same calculation, and thus they're incentivized to expose the expansion of the suffrage. Think, for example, of white supremacists, capital D Democrats, opposing black suffrage at the time of the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution. That means an expansion can only happen when the bloc supporting it temporarily has taken control of the government, as Republicans did after the Civil War when the Confederate states were not represented in Congress and Northern Democrats were not in a very strong position because of the near treason many of them had committed during the Civil War. The other explanation for suffrage expansion is ideological, and it is often connected with a war. People often start thinking differently about a previously disfranchised group because of the contributions that group has made to the war effort. This is what happened with African Americans during the Civil War, leading to the 15th Amendment. 
This is what happened with women in World War I, leading to the 19th Amendment. And this is what happened with 18-year-olds during the war in Vietnam, leading to the 26th Amendment. One difficulty securing women's suffrage was that, unlike with African Americans, there was no particular reason to expect women to lean more to one party or the other, which means neither political party had any obvious incentive to support enfranchisement of women. The sizable gender gap that which we, we identify with politics today did not exist at the late 19th and early 20th centuries. With neither political party having a strong material incentive to enfranchise women, the risk incentive of politicians and of the male political community would be difficult to overcome. What changed over time was a shift in the political agenda, the sort of issues that get debated in politics. That, that shift created a stronger ideological argument for women to vote, as well as a material incentive for a particular block of voters to support the enfranchisement of women. That shift in the political agenda was created by progressivism early in the 20th century. Then World War I enabled a movement that had already made great progress to get over the final hurdle. So to trace the general outlines of that story, women's suffrage was adopted west to east, never willingly in the South, whose outlier status had to be suppressed by the 19th Amendment. The first American jurisdictions to enact women's suffrage were the Western territories of Wyoming and Utah around 1870. The main explanation for that seems to be that traditional gender roles were up for grabs more along the frontier where women often played the same economic roles as men. Less gender differentiated social and economic roles meant less of a gendered separate spheres ideology. For example, Wyoming territory not only enfranchised women, it also provided by statute that female teachers should get equal pay, and it allowed women to become justices of the peace, which would not have been the norm in the rest of the country. The first states to enact women's suffrage were those same western states, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho, all of which adopted women's suffrage between 1890 and 1896. This was a time when eastern states were still decisively rejecting women's suffrage. For example, Massachusetts had a non-binding referendum on whether to enfranchise women in local elections, and that was rejected by a margin of two to one in 1895. Even on the West Coast, voters were still rejecting women's suffrage, although by closer margins than in the East, California, for example, had a referendum in 1896 rejecting women's suffrage by 55 to 45%. No other state adopted women's suffrage between 1896 and 1910. That was a period in which suffrage across the country generally was being restricted. Blacks were being almost universally disfranchised in the South, and northern states were showing greater support and aggressive enforcement of literacy tests to disfranchise a limerick illiterate Catholic and Jewish immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. Women's suffrage was fighting an uphill battle in those years because of the general movement toward constricting the suffrage. Then the states on the West Coast all adopted women's suffrage by referendum between 1910 and 1912, quickly followed by every other state west of the Mississippi River but one by 1915, but no states east of the Mississippi River. Midwestern states, such as Michigan and Illinois, were still decisively rejecting women's suffrage in referenda in 1912-1913. Women's suffrage at this time still had relatively little support in the South, mostly because of the more conservative theology, but also the fact that women still played more traditional roles in the South. They were more likely to be less well-educated. They were more likely to have larger families and they were more likely to live in farms rather than on cities. So what explains the dramatic shift from four states enacting women's suffrage by 1910 and 30 states having adopted it by 1920 when the federal constitutional amendment finally passed? There were longer term factors advancing the cause of women's suffrage, but those probably can't explain this short term expansion between 1910 and 1920. Just to note what those are, the longer term factors include 
women becoming much better educated. Up to a third of college graduates in 1900 were already women. More women were in the workforce, and more middle class women in cities were uh, enjoying smaller families and more leisure time through labor saving technology, enabling them to enlist in social reform movements such as the crusade for women's suffrage. In the short term, though, there were clearly two vital factors at work. The first was progressivism, which explains the adoption by all the states west of the Mississippi River between 1910 and 1915, except, I think, for New Mexico. And the second was World War I. <laughs> that was 15 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You, you're at World War I. You can take us. Can... If I have time, I'll pick up the story. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. We're on the edge of our seats. <laughs> on the eve of the First World War. <laughs> so, I will try to pick up <laughs> uh, where Professor Clarman uh, left off. So, uh, we've actually entered into an unprecedented moment in US history uh, because the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, as of uh, about a month ago, uh, was ratified by 38 states, uh, the 38th state being Virginia. Um, and it's really the first time that we have 38 ratifications of an amendment that was adopted by both houses of Congress, albeit almost 50 years ago, uh, but is now uh, on an uncertain path to being added to the Constitution uh, because of the deadline on ratification. Uh, when Congress adopted it in 1972, there was a seven-year deadline. Uh, and then that deadline was once uh, extended in 1978, so the deadline was 1982. Uh, so the main questions now facing the ERA are, uh, is it too late to add it to the Constitution? Uh, and what will it do uh, as law? What will it do for women even if it is added? Uh, and those are questions that I address uh, in my forthcoming book, We the Women, The Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, but there's a third question I think that's highly relevant uh, to those two questions, which I think gets talked about a little bit less, and I want to focus on that today, which is, why has the Equal Rights Amendment taken so long? Uh, that is, uh, as uh, Dean Manning uh, mentioned er earlier, uh, it was introduced immediately after the 19th Amendment was ratified. It was introduced in 1923. So it's taken about 100 years, uh, first 50 years before uh, Congress actually adopted it by the requisite two-thirds majority of uh, both houses of Congress, uh, and then another 50 years to get to the three-fourths of state ratifications, which just really um, happened at the beginning uh, of this year. Uh, and, um, and I want to try to think about why it took so long as a way of answering whether or not it should be too late now, uh, as the House has uh, passed a resolution uh, removing the deadline on ERA ratification uh, less than a month ago, and, uh, and uh, thinking about what it would actually do, what the meaning of the ERA would be uh, in the 21st century, an amendment that's been transgenerational and 100 years uh, in the making. Uh, and we can begin uh, by noting also that uh, Seven-year deadlines on constitutional amendments for ratification became a normal part of constitutional practice uh, in 1917 with the introduction of the Prohibition Amendment and was used for every constitutional amendment that actually got added to the Constitution in the 20th century thereafter, except for the 19th Amendment. Uh, so with the 19th Amendment, it was actually proposed to have a deadline on ratification, and it was rejected uh, in 1918 uh, in part because they were recognizing the long battle uh, that Professor Klarman uh, has uh, begun to told you about, tell you about here uh, to, to get uh, suffrage, that it was a process that really began in Seneca Falls in 1848 uh, and took until uh, 1920 uh, to, before it was fully ratified. Uh, and, and so I think that it is important that that's one exception to the general rule that seven-year deadlines um, have been inserted uh, into amendments. And um, the ERA was introduced uh, in 1923. It was Alice Paul, a suffragist who brought jail time and confrontations with the president uh, to the suffrage movement. But actually, the drafting uh, was engaged in by Crystal Eastman, who is actually a lawyer and had written a very important book about workers' compensation before then. Uh, and the fact, and Crystal Eastman's involvement uh, in uh, drafting the Equal Rights Amendment is important to understanding uh, what was intended. That is, um, they wanted an Equal Rights Amendment after suffrage uh, to guarantee equal rights uh, 
regardless of sex, in all domains, not only voting. Uh, that is, they, they wanted the law to stop making uh, sex distinctions when it came to things like married women's property, uh, the authority of uh, women uh, over their own children as mothers. Uh, typically under state law, only fathers had guardianship over their children, uh, and mothers did not have legal equal guardianship over their own children. Uh, and so it wasn't, but it was not only to get rid of these kinds of distinctions, but also uh, in Crystal Eastman's view, uh, which was shared to some degree with Alice Paul, uh, there was a desire to have uh, a comprehensive women's equality agenda that included uh, equal access to employment, uh, included the education of men and women for egalitarian roles within the home at, as well as in the public sphere, uh, voluntary motherhood, access to birth control, uh, and then what Crystal Eastman called a motherhood endowment, uh, what we would call paid parental leave. That is, uh, it was understood that women really could not have equal opportunity in economic and political life unless they had some access to support for uh, childbearing and childbearing. Uh, and that was part of the original ambition, uh, much broader ambition for the ERA than I think um, is often understood today. Uh, in any case, a lot of feminists who had worked on suffrage did not get behind the ERA immediately in the 1920s, and it was because uh, they were operating uh, under, in the context of a Supreme Court uh, that was willing to strike down labor protections for women only. Uh, and uh, this was uh, this was something that came to the fore in the Adkins decision, Adkins versus Children's Hospital in 1923. Uh, prior to that, uh, despite Lochner, uh, the court was willing to preserve uh, labor protections for women only uh, on the grounds that women didn't even have the right to vote. Of course, they were going to be more susceptible to oppression uh, and exploitation. Uh, so uh, they allowed minimum wages for women only, maximum hours for women only, on the grounds that women were mothers and needed to be protected. Uh, but in Atkins versus Children's Hospital, right after the 19th Amendment is ratified, the Supreme Court uh, strikes down uh, DC law on minimum wages for women only, uh, saying, citing I mean, it's a 14th Amendment decision applying Lochner to all sexes, uh, but uh, they also cite the 19th Amendment, saying the 19th Amendment is evidence that gender inequality is coming to a vanishing point um, at this moment in time, uh, and therefore uh, women don't need any protections. Uh, and, uh, and so it was in this context, of course, that social reformers, uh, women like Florence Kelly uh, and others, uh, we're very skeptical of an ERA. If the ERA was going to be handed over to a Supreme Court uh, that was willing to strike down labor protections for women only, uh, and generally was generally hostile to, to uh, labor regulation, uh, they thought that the ERA could be uh, interpreted by a ju ju judiciary uh, in a way that would actually be bad for women uh, and bad for mothers. Uh, and so the ERA really doesn't get off the ground, never really go, gets to the floor in Congress, although there are hearings throughout the 20s uh, and the 30s. Uh, and then you do get some floor debates uh, in the 40s. Uh, and then two thirds of the Senate actually adopts it twice in the 1950s. Uh, and when they adopt it, there's actually an exemption in the ERA uh, for um, the protection of, um, of women and the promotion of health and welfare. Uh, this was known as the Hayden Rider. Carl Hayden, a senator from Arizona, uh, drafted that. Uh, and, um, and so you see how the ERA really starts uh, getting some play in the 1950s only when it's understood um, that it's going to be compatible with protections for women, although it's highly controversial because um, the women who sponsored the ERA, even though they ultimately voted for it, even with the exemption in place, didn't want that exemption there because they were afraid that efforts to protect women were actually ways of depriving women of equal employment opportunity. Uh, but the other thing is that the real reason that you don't see any activity uh, in Congress between the mid-1950s and 1970 uh, on the ERA is that really the ERA is being bottled up in committee. Emanuel Seller, who is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee for many years from the mid-50s uh, to the early 1970s, did not let it get out of committee. And so even though there was growing uh, popular support uh, for the ERA, and, um, and the votes in, uh, in the House, at least, uh, if not in both houses of Congress, uh, to pass the ERA, it stayed bottled up in committee for, um, for over a decade. Uh, and then finally, um, it gets a floor debate in 1970 because Martha Griffiths, there are about 10 women in Congress um, at the time out of 535, uh, but in 1970, Martha Griffiths does a discharge petition uh, 
uh, which require signatures of at least half of the House uh, to discharge the Judiciary Committee uh, of uh, its control of the uh, ERA. So then it finally gets a floor debate. And after the floor debate, um, there are over 350 votes for the ERA in the House in 1970 while they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and at that moment, um, that's 96% of the House voting uh, to, um, to adopt the ERA. Uh, and what happens in 1970, the version that got adopted in 1970 by 96% of the House did not have a deadline. Uh, and it gets a deadline when it goes to the Senate that, that year. It goes to the Senate, and in the Senate, there are no, uh, no limits on debate uh, in the Senate. And that meant that some of the Southerners who filibustered the Civil Rights Act in 1964 were around in 1970, um, taking up a lot of airtime uh, to debate about uh, ways that they could possibly change the ERA to make it more, more um, appealing to them. Uh, and that meant putting in the seven-year deadline. Um, they tried to put in an exemption also, uh, exempting women from military service. So those two things were packaged together. Uh, and that amendment was put into the ERA in the Senate. Uh, and then finally, they also tried to put in an amendment packaged with the ERA, ending busing in the South. That one actually failed, but the version that emerges in the S Senate in 1970 has the seven-year deadline and has the military exemption. Uh, but it's October 1970, right before elections. If they change the ERA that 96% of the House already adopted, what that effectively meant was sending it to the legislative graveyard because there is no way they're going to have time to go into conference uh, and reconcile uh, their differences and have a version of the ERA that they could actually send out to the states for ratification. So the ERA actually died once in 1970, but then when they come back in 1971, and that's the term, the 92nd Congress, that actually adopts the ERA, that's the term uh, that, um, where it's successful, but Martha Griffiths, the original sponsor of the ERA bill, uh, she adds that seven-year deadline in, uh, in part because she's saving all her political capital to make sure that that military exemption is not there. So all the ca and she says, you know, I'm just going to agree to the seven-year deadline because uh, I actually think it's going to get ratified really quickly. Right? She did not predict the kinds of resistance that you would see with the Stop ERA movement, uh, but that's how we end up with the deadline in the version that gets sent out to the states for ratification uh, in 1972. Uh, and, uh, and what's very interesting about that deadline is that very often the story gets told that she didn't foresee Phyllis Schlafly's rise. Uh, and Phyllis Schlafly opposing the ERA with the Stop ERA movement, appealing to the mothers and housewives of America, claiming that the ERA would destroy the family. Um, Phyllis Schlafly did not invent those arguments. Those arguments actually came from Sam Irvin, uh, who was a segregationist who um, was part of the filibuster of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But in 1970, he gives speeches on the floor saying, uh, God couldn't do everything, so he invented mothers. Uh, and that's why we need to have the, these exemptions in the ERA or not have an ERA at all. Um, that is, Sam Irvin really proliferated the discourse in 1970 that the ERA would be bad for mothers and bad for families, when in fact Martha Griffiths, and it was bipartisan, that is, the supporters of the ERA in the House and in the Senate, uh, it was really uh, Republican women like Margaret Heckler and Florence Dwyer, uh, who really stood up in favor of the ERA on the, on the understanding that it would actually uh, help women overcome disadvantages that they faced uh, because they were mothers. And the vision of the ERA dating back to Crystal Eastman that was embraced by Martha Griffiths, and then the first women of color who were elected to the House, Shirley Chisholm and Patsy Mink, uh, their vision was that if there were any protections that were for women only, they would just be expanded uh, to include men. Um, rather than struck down entirely the way that the Atkins court had done after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and so that was the vision that they had, but Phyllis Schlafly really was able to convince uh, a lot of mothers and housewives to organize against the ERA in the 1970s. Um, but one last point I want to make before we get into, um, as many of you know, Nevada, Virginia, and Illinois are the states that um, recently ratified. Um, those states also faced ratification battles in the 70s. And uh, Phyllis Schlafly's movement did not single-handedly defeat ratification in those battleground states. Those, these are all states that had parliamentary systems that made Phyllis Schlafly's job pretty easy. That is, in the Virginia House of Delegates, there were barely any women there, 
And despite rising popular support for the ERA, there was one committee, the Privileges and Elections Committee, um, that kept voting to keep the ERA off the floor uh, of the Virginia House of Delegates for many years. Uh, and that's where a lot of the battle was fought. In Illinois, they had a constitutional provision which Justice Stevens, as a Seventh Circuit uh, judge, said was unconstitutional. The Illinois Constitution said you needed three-fifths uh, of the state legislature to ratify a federal constitutional amendment. Uh, that was not constitutional, but judge, then Judge Stevens said, even though you can't have it in the Illinois Constitution, the legislative chambers are free to devise their own rules as to how they're going to ratify federal amendments. So in Illinois, year after year, you get constitutional majorities, 50, 51 percent, uh, um, voting to ratify the ERA, but it's not enough because they have an internal rule um, that requires uh, a 60 percent vote. So, um, so I, I think if we think, consider all of these things um, that went into getting the seven-year deadline in, uh, and then in the states, all the things that delayed it. I think as we come to the debate today, uh, the reason, the main reason to have an ERA is to overcome this history of obstruction. Uh, that is, it's, an, it's a history that has something to do with the status of mothers uh, in the Constitution. But at the same time, I think um, a lot of what has happened um, is uh, a story about how our constitutional structure actually makes it very hard for those not included uh, to become included. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, which I heard the end of my apologies. Uh, uh, the airplane that I was supposed to be on at 9.30 was deferred many times. First ended up at three when I got on the next plane. When I'd arrived here, it had been canceled. So I just uh, couldn't get here on time as I'd hoped to. I I'm gonna address uh, hopefully three things that haven't been addressed, but not having been here, forgive me if I'm repeating. One is to identify a couple of the uh, legal questions about the current procedural status of the ER. Uh, the second is to situate how to think about those uh, and how to think about the roles of Congress and courts in deciding them. And to put that in the context of broader um, currents of scholarship about the exercise of constituent power, that is the power to make a constitution and may be subject to some constraints, the power to amend a constitution. And last, and I'll just say this now, so because I'll run out of time, uh, to say that, that it's, it would be a big mistake, I think, for people in the United States to give up on the amending process as a democratic tool for moving constitutional law in directions that popular majorities want. All right, so that was all on my third point. Okay, what are some of the legal issues? You may have heard these. It was implicit in um, Professor Sook's talk. Uh, one is about time limits. This was an amendment that had a time limit. The time limit was extended. Does that have any effect on the legality or relevance of more recent ratifications? Well, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, could Congress enact a new resolution further extending the time? We don't know the answer to that, although a great deal of deference has been given to Congress's power to design procedures, so perhaps. The second issue is, has it just been pending for too long? Does the Constitution in Article 5 contemplate, when it says three-fourths of the states, three-fourths of the states within something like a contemporaneous moment or a generation? Very strong arguments to this effect, and in fact, the Supreme Court, in a case called Dillon against Gloss, endorsed that view in the 1920s in the context of a case upholding Congress's power to place a reasonable limit on the time for amendment. And I actually don't remember if it was talking about prohibition or suffrage, but it was talking about either 18 or 19. Thank you. Um, and the court says, of course, the amendments that went out to the states in 1791, the two that weren't amended, are now too old because you couldn't, unless you have re revived contemporaneous adoption. OK. Coleman against Miller, which I'm suspecting has been mentioned here, treats issues like that as non-justiciable. But the court is very narrowly divided. <laughs> 
in Coleman and Miller. Um, and then in the early 1990s, an amendment called the 27th Amendment joins the Constitution. And this was one of those two that went out to the states. It says, pay of a congressman can't be increased without an intervening election. And how did it get ratified? It relied on the ratifications it got in the 1790s and a sprinkling in the 19th century, and then a sprinkling in the 1980s. And altogether, it added up to three-fourths. Well, who had standing to challenge it? Who had? To? So the archivist declares it part of the Constitution. No court, as far as I know, or at least certainly not the Supreme Court, has touched it. So if 1791 to 1992 is not too long, OK, so that's a historical precedent. We don't know the answer to this. The effect of rescissions is the third issue we do not know the answer to. But as I'm, I'm guessing you might have heard earlier, there were five states that ratified the ERA in the 1970s, but then enacted laws that looked like rescissions. Or in one case, I think the state said, if ratification doesn't happen by 1979, uh, we withdraw it. All right, do we know the effect of these? This uh, Coleman and Miller case in the 30s said uh, questions about the effect of rescission uh, are political questions, non-justiciable for Congress to decide uh, relying on a precedent I'm guessing you heard about from Professor Klarman involving the 14th Amendment. Uh, no, okay. Um, no time to describe that to you, but let me just say it was, <laughs> it was, it was a, it, Coleman and Miller contested decision to give you an idea, um, five to four, they're standing. The four justices who think there is standing then make up the majority that says it's a political, the, the other issues are political questions, even though they didn't think the case actually was justiciable. That's just, and the nine member court was evenly divided on the justiciability of one issue. Math is complicated. All right, so those are some of the questions. On the role of the court, I've already indicated before Coleman and Miller, in a number of cases from the 1790s through the 1920s, issues about the Article V amending procedure were presented to the Supreme Court and were decided by it. The court never found a procedural barrier to an amendment that appeared to have sufficient ratifications. So there's a major debate, still an important debate in the literature between Professor Tribe of this law school and Professor Dellinger of Duke about how, how much courts should decide in these areas. Professor Dellinger arguing that there's a real benefit to clarity with an amending process. And you get that kind of clarity when the court decides something. Professor Tribe said, well, when there's an amendment, it means something in the existing order is awry. It might even have to do with the court's own decisions and efforts to do something to make them different. And the court should stay back, not wash its hands altogether, but allow a great deal of room. So the benefits of judicial decision, main one I think is clarity. The benefits of leaving it to Congress might be understood under the heading of legitimacy. The heading of legitimacy. And if you think in the current political context, what happens if the court says enough and whoever's controlling Congress says this is a fraud, it, it doesn't set up well for good outcomes maybe in the litigation, but these are competing values. Now, uh, the point about the literature on constituent power that I want to make, and I want to give great credit to one of our Clemenco fellows, Josh Braver, who has written about this, is the idea that in remaking or making a constitution, it is wrong to think that there's just a binary between being legal and being illegal. That there might be procedures that while they are not fully in compliance with existing rules, are nonetheless lawful in the sense that they develop a set of rules designed to promote deliberation, to hear from the opposition, to ensure widespread support. And that's a very interesting idea. And it strikes me in light of that, that arguments like Professor Tribe's in favor of allowing more room for decision making by political branches on issues like what's the effect of a rescission might really make some sense. Um, 
And I think given that it's quarter of, and you've been probably being talked at for 35 or 40 minutes, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for those fantastic presentations. We do have so much to speak about. I'm just going to take the prerogative of the first question here. And I guess my question is for all three panelists. Um, but I'm, I guess we could begin in the, go in the order in which uh, you spoke, which will give Professor Klarman an opportunity to get us to the edge of, of ratification in 1920. Um, I wonder if in describing the series of obstacles that um, the 19th Amendment faced and the ERA faced and continues to face, that each of you have maybe underestimated the objections of women themselves and this, the very powerful arguments that women have made against suffrage and against equal rights. It seemed to me, I know again, you were absolutely short for time, Michael, but you didn't talk about anti-suffragists uh, at all. Um, you, you, you talked about a number of different obstacles, especially political coalitions, the nature of the political party system, uh, specific political ideologies. But we didn't hear about women who were advocates for separate spheres. Um, similarly, um, Julie, you talked about, for instance, Florence Kelly as op opposing the ERA strategy in the wake of the Adkins decision. But as I read Kelly, she actually didn't believe in the ERA. She believed in specific protections for women. Um, it wasn't merely a tactical decision. She quite clearly believed that the Equal Rights Amendment would, would, would undermine, as of course, and I think she was right about this certainly at the time. Um, and we could say the same. I would say, actually, that Sam Rubin has no responsibility for Phyllis Schlafly, but that Florence Kelly does have response. I think that all of Schlafly's protectionist arguments come from progressive women who oppose the Equal Rights Amendment. And that intellectual and political genealogy is really important for understanding the obstacles that I think face ratification today. So similarly, I guess, Professor Jackson, with your, you, you were going in a different direction from talking about specific constituencies or, or uh, uh, political movements, but with regard to the dem democratic legitimacy argument that you mentioned, I think we, it, it might, a plausible interpretation might be that the threat of that democratic illegitimacy has to do with the anti-feminism of conservatisms, of, of modern conservatism uh, in its Trumpian manifestation. Um, so I wonder, I guess I just wonder if in terms of reckoning, the, the history is so important for us understanding what might come next, what steps might be right to be ne to come next, and if we maybe haven't really understood the nature of the opposition, uh, we're, we're in some peril. So could we? May I have brief comments on from each of the three of you? And then after that, we'll go right to the audience. You want me to go first? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so it's a really good point, and I would just sort of generalize and say that one of the insidious aspects of ideologies that develop around status quo relationships are that the people who are subordinated within the ideology often internalize the ideology. So lots of women believe that separate spheres was actually good for women, and there were actually lots of African Americans who didn't support the civil rights movement, who did not want Martin Luther King wreaking havoc in Birmingham, and didn't want Thurgood Marshall challenging segregation, and there were lots of gays and lesbians who didn't support the gay rights movement because they had internalized the hateful messages of the dominant ideology of, of, uh, of homosexuality. So it's not unusual. That's part of what makes change so different is even the people who are subordinated by the dominant ideology internalize its message, which was easier because, as Justice Brennan, one easier with regard to gender, because as Justice Brennan pointed out, putting women on the pedestal and putting women in, the in a cage were just the opposite sides of the same coin. It's harder to convince African Americans that Jim Crow was good for them, that lynching was good for them, than it was to convince women that they were better off not having the right to vote, that they were better off uh, not having an ERA that could lead to striking down minimum wage and maximum hour laws. Having said that, it's, it's almost always the subordinated group that is the primary mover of change. It's not like that, that, that most men were leading the movement for the ERA or women's suffrage, and it's not like most white people were leading the civil rights movement. So even though, and this is something that, this is something that Thurgood Marshall knew, Charles Hamilton Houston, the great black lawyer, knew, one of their principal obstacles facing them was convincing black people not only that the status quo 
was subject to change, but that it actually should be changed, right? It was really easy to convince blacks who live in a world where everybody told them that they were inferior and that they shouldn't be integrated. It was very difficult to convince you know, children in that regard that they shouldn't internalize those messages. So the same thing's true about Phyllis Schlafly. I mean, the fact that she convinced women that it was not in their interest to do these things doesn't mean that in some sense it wasn't in their interest to do it. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing as a question. None, none of the three of us talked about this. I go out on a limb and state the point provocatively. It's not clear to me that the ERA being law changes one single outcome in any litigated case before a court. I don't say that to disparage the ERA. I'll, I'm all in favor of the ERA. I think symbolic equality is a good thing. But given what the Supreme Court did in the 1970s and 1980s under the Equal Protection Clause, it's not clear to me. And indeed, I think there is not a single case that would necessarily come out differently if the ERA were law as opposed to it not being law. And it would be, to me, interesting to hear the others talk about that. Because while I think it's important to do it symbolically, I'm not sure legally anything turns on whether the ERA is part of the Constitution. OK. So I want to quickly respond to that, and then I'll get to Jill's question. So uh, I think that it is true that the ERA wouldn't change a lot of the law that we have, but I, don't, I wouldn't call it merely symbolic, uh, because part of the reason that we got uh, a switch in the equal protection cases in the 1970s, before 1971, the Supreme Court had never uh, recognized sex discrimination as a constitutional problem, and the timing's not a coincidence. Uh, it's really after the House votes by an overwhelming over 90% majority uh, to send the ERA to the states for ratification. And then the Supreme Court in Frontiero versus Richardson actually cites the ERA uh, as uh, evidence of co like overwhelming congressional support for the principle that sex discrimination should be scrutinized. So I think the ERA has already quietly uh, made sex discrimination law. And it's just a question of, do we recognize women's work by a, a formal amendment or not? Uh, and I think that not having the ERA undervalues the work that women have put in for 100 years uh, to make constitutional change that we already have. And I would not frame that as just a, a merely symbolic difference. And I think it can actually make a real legal difference on um, equal protection cases around things like pregnancy and maternity. The Supreme Court has said that pregnancy discrimination is not an equal protection problem. Uh, and if you look at the legislative history from the 1970s, as well as the legislative history of recent ratifications in Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia, Pregnancy discrimination and the lack of response uh, to the work family problem has been a very important part of why people think that the ERA is important. So that's it, and I think that's law that could change if we get an ERA. Um, so that said, um, I, to I, I think you're right, Jill, that people like Florence Kelly, they, they did call it the so-called Equal Rights Amendment, and it was complicated because National League of Women Voters, there were all these women's groups uh, that did not support the ERA. Uh, but uh, there was a fight within the legislative history about gender equality amendments in Germany, for example, in other countries, which they looked at. Both sides actually looked at them uh, with envy. Uh, but the, uh, those who opposed the ERA in the 20s said that we would not end up getting the kinds of protections for mothers that they have in Germany um, if we got, got the ERA here, because in the words of Dorothy Kenyon, who went on to litigate uh, for the ACLU, the sex discrimination cases, she said the ER, ERA right now uh, in the late 1920s would be a blind man with a shotgun. And she was talking about Lochner. She was talking about Atkins. Uh, by the 1970s, Dorothy Kenyon totally changes her position on the ERA. She says, we've been waiting for change for so long. We've been trying with equal protection for so long. It's time to try something different. And she advocates for the ERA at that point. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not sure how fully I can respond, uh, Jill, to your question. On the issue Michael um, raised, um, I agree with Professor Sook, but Professor Clark and Professor Sook, sorry. Uh, I think legally the place where an enacted ERA would have bite is if there were attempts to roll back for example, the Federal Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which Congress enacted in the 1970s to overturn the effects of a Supreme Court decision that uh, Professor Sook referred to. So I think that with an Equal Rights Amendment, there might be a, an even more robust constitutional um, basis for it. Having said that, um, it is, not clear to me that the standard of review would change in a meaningful way. We might say, oh, we'll get strict scrutiny now. 
but I'm really not sure that at the level we're at, it will matter in any of the litigated um, cases. And if we are in strict scrutiny land for gender cl sex classifications, uh, it will predictably have an adverse effect on affirmative action programs designed to get women, for example, into STEM fields or men into traditional care fields. And as we can see from analogous language in the First Amendment, this amendment is gonna be open to a massive amount of interpretation. Um, so it will have some of the features going forward of being a little bit indeterminate. The symbolic importance of it, I think, is considerable. Um, and so uh, I think that's what I would say. And on democratic legitimacy and uh, Trumpian populism, um, you know, I think we're, we're engaged in a political struggle. And I don't know how it's going to come out. Um, I do know that this administration has had a lot of appointments to the courts. Um, and Congress seems to be more in play. Um, and uh, so that might bear on, on where you think um, where you think uh, democratic legitimacy on the one hand and the more legality court deciding approach would, would end up on the other. Great, thanks. Um, questions from the room? I'm just going to repeat the question for the recording, which was whether anyone would, could speak to how the transgender voice fits into this discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So I think this is one of the advantages, I think, to continuing to ratify an ERA that started, I mean, the version that was um, uh, introduced in the 70s, because I think that there's a transgenerational meaning um, that yet it's not just made by the moment of congressional adoption in 1972, but also by the recent ratification history. Uh, and I think it's really uh, in the recent ratification history in the House's report extend, um, removing the deadline that's more recent, um, they understand uh, the um, not abridged on account of sex to include uh, sex broadly understood as including sexual orientation and gender identity. As we know from the court's cases, that's a controversial position. Uh, but uh, it's also very uh, powerful, I think, that in Virginia, uh, as it was being ratified, Danica Rome, who's the first transgender legislator in Virginia, uh, gave a very interesting and important floor speech uh, confirming this understanding uh, of ERA ratification today. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Jackson a question to follow up with your remarks about um, the possibility of Americans giving up on the amendment process and the dangers of that. Um, and I wonder, just as, as a pessimist looking ahead to a worst case scenario here with regard to democratic legitimacy from the vantage of those who support the ERA, is there an outcome here looking ahead to fears? And anyone could speak on this, but I was just really struck by your remarks about that sense of uh, the possibility of giving up on this entire constitutional right. Is there, is, there, is there an outcome here that leads us to a place that, that is the same as the place impeachment is at right now? Well, I don't know where impeachment is at. When you've got uh, the Senate controlled by the president's own party, it is predictably difficult to get a conviction. So much depends on po politics. Um, the reason I said what I said, and again, that's probably the closest I'll come to answering your specific question, Professor Lepore. The reason I said what I did is in the 1990s, Kathleen Sullivan wrote a very influential article uh, against amendment-itis. And she said, you know, the people in Congress, and she, it was mostly Republican proposals to amend to bar busing and amend to allow school prayer. And the argument was we shouldn't be amending the to amend to allow flag burning prohibition. We shouldn't be amending the Constitution. It's too special. It's very important that. And um, ten or fifteen years later, after Citizens and United came down, I wrote a piece saying, "Yeah, amendmentitis is a problem, but it's not a big risk under our Constitution. What is a bigger risk is what I called amendophobia." That is an unwillingness to use a democratic tool and procedure provided in the Constitution. And so that's the framework mm -hmm. that I'm speaking behind. But as Professor, I, I think, Sook mentioned, or Professor Klarman, probably both of them, 
The fact that the ERA had come out of Congress in the early 70s certainly did not hurt the effort towards expanding the court's understanding of 14th Amendment equal protection in the direction. It, it only hurt in a little bit, but, but Powell on what standard to adopt, but the general thrust of the decisions was towards more equal treatment. Wonderful. Well, we are at time, I'm sorry to say. Thanks, the panelists, for a wonderful discussion that I hope we can continue. Thank you.